We live in an age where we have unprecedented access to information, studies and research on the web. This in turn might lead you to assume that we would be better educated and wiser than ever before. Unfortunately though, it doesn't take much research before you realise that a lot of this information is contradictory. And it seems that every few years, everything we know about nutrition is turned on its head. Fats are bad for us, then they're good for us, then HDL cholesterol is good for us but LDL isn't, then all cholesterol is good for us. How can you know what to trust? Before you get too disheartened, know that these constant paradigm shifts are actually an example of good science. The objective of any scientific study or research should be to try and disprove, not prove, a theory. Theories that can't be disproved are what we call unfalsifiable. That's not to say that they're incorrect, but simply that they aren't scientific, as they can't be subjected to rigorous testing. Bullshit! That's all science is doing. Testing theories. Testing that things work. When someone says that they don't trust science, what they're really saying is that they don't trust testing things. And to me that's foolishness, especially when it comes to our health. By trying to constantly disprove theories and upset the status quo, scientists are able to remain unbiased and objective. Not only that, but it's generally impossible to prove with absolute certainty that something is true. The unfortunate byproduct of all this though is that what is held to be the best advice one year might not be what is considered the best advice the next year. And this is especially problematic when the official guidelines provided by health organisations and governments are not updated in a timely manner to reflect our new discoveries. It's also a problem when a company jumps to early conclusions regarding preliminary weak results and thus tries to sell us on snake oil products. Does this mean you can't trust any research because it's only going to change somewhere down the line? Not really. While our precise understanding may change over time, this doesn't generally change the practical advice so frequently or so drastically. Think of quantum physics. The discovery of quantum mechanics shows that classical Newtonian physics don't work at a subatomic scale, but that doesn't mean that an apple won't still fall to the floor when you drop it. Health is similar, for the most part. This is also why it's important though to do your own research and to draw your own conclusions. Apply a little common sense, try out different ideas and stick with what works. And of course, learning to properly assess the validity of different studies is also very important. When two studies disagree, it's usually because one of those studies has been carried out poorly. Let's see how you can identify that for yourself. Statistical significance. As mentioned, no study can say with absolute certainty that anything is true. It can only refute existing theories. One reason for this is that there's always the element of chance. So let's say I've got a supplement called ultra strong supplement and I want to find out if it works or not before I start selling it. So I give it to five participants and I look at their strength before they start taking the supplement and afterwards. If those five participants all got stronger noticeably then I might conclude that my supplement, ultra strong supplement, was effective. However there's actually a very good chance that that was just a complete fluke. Perhaps those five people were just recovering from colds and so at the end of the study they were stronger than they were at the start. Or perhaps they were just hitting their stride at the gym or maybe some other factor led to them getting stronger. I can't prove that that wasn't just a coincidence. And that's why you need a much larger sample. The larger the sample, the less likely it is that it was just a coincidence. So if I had 100 participants and 99 of them got stronger using ultra strong supplement, then I might conclude that it's highly likely that they did get stronger because of this supplement. Thus studies are forced to deal with the significance of data. This basically tells you how likely it is statistically for the results to have been caused by what you were testing. This is measured with the p-value where p equals 0.04 would mean that there was a 4% likelihood that your results were a fluke. Generally it's considered that a significant result is 5% or below. Only then can a researcher claim that they found some kind of real world relationship and reject their null hypothesis, the prediction that nothing of note will happen. What this tells you though is that when you see a big study published in the news, there's still possibly a 5% chance that it was just luck. Don't read the hyperbolic Daily Mail headlines then. Go straight to the source of the study and find out what the statistical significance really was. Then you're probably safe to assume that the results were at least not just chance. Samples. But we also need to think about the nature of those participants. If all of those participants were people who regularly went to the gym anyways, then it might not have actually been the case that this supplement worked for everyone. It might have only worked for people who had experience in the gym 
already. Therefore, we need to get a more representative sample. In that case, we might get a stratified sample. And that means that the sample is designed to be reflective of the general public. It means we've got roughly the right number of men and women, roughly the right number of different races, different ages, different demographics. Many studies will use something called opportunity sampling, meaning they get participants wherever they can. Often these participants will be found at universities because this is where a lot of research is carried out. That means that the participants might well be students. At the very least, it means they're all the kind of person who are willing to participate in studies. Thus, you should check to see if the sample is an opportunity sample, a quota sample designed to include representatives from different demographics, a random sample, or a stratified sample designed to be a mini reproduction of the actual population. Many studies use random samples, which generally should be representative if the sample is large enough. Confounding variables. So if a study uses a huge sample that is completely random and likely representative of the general population and their findings are highly significant, can you trust it? Not necessarily. If a study is badly designed, then it can still have misleading results, even when they are significant. For instance, if I were to give my cure for the flu to a million people that I knew were currently getting better, then I would have a highly significant result that nevertheless wasn't worth anything. It's unusual for anyone to so flagrantly attempt to play the system though. More likely is that they simply failed to account for the fact that everyone had been ill for roughly the same amount of time and was showing signs of improvement. This is what's known as a confounding variable. Maybe you got your participants to swallow down their new pill with milk, and perhaps it was actually the milk that gave them the results. So a confounding variable is anything else that could have affected the study. So in the case of our uh, super strong supplement, that could be the fact that we gave the super strong supplement to people, then we introduced a new workout routine at the same time. That would be a very bad design, and that would be an example of a confounding variable. Now, of course, in observational studies where we're not actually um, interfering, where we're not carrying the study out in a lab, confounding variables are much more common because we can't control for every factor. So we might look at people who eat lots of hot dogs and we might notice that they gain weight. We spot that correlation. However, we haven't considered all the other factors. For instance, someone who eats hot dogs is also much more likely to eat Mars bars, is much more likely to exercise less. These are all confounding variables. And unless we control for them by, for instance, forcing people who don't eat hot dogs to eat all the other junk food and to not exercise, then we can't say with certainty that the hot dogs caused the obesity. We can only say there's a correlation. And that's one of the trials, that's one of the uh, issues when we use any kind of observational study. Thus, you can say that in a real world setting, eating more hot dogs correlates with worse health. That is to say that someone who eats more hot dogs is likely to have poorer health. What you cannot say though, is that the hot dogs were what caused the bad health. This doesn't only apply to observational studies either. Thus, a good study should do everything it can to eliminate or account for confounding variables. A study looking at diet, for instance, should control precisely what's being eaten, make sure that the participants are getting similar amounts of exercise, and generally avoid anything that might influence the outcome of the study. Normally, this means creating a control group. That means you're splitting the sample in half and only intervening with one of the two groups. So you might give one group your experimental treatment and the other one no experimental treatment. The idea of this is to create a group that you can compare the results to where the only difference is the new medicine or whatever variable you're testing. So maybe different participants have different diets, but this shouldn't be true in both groups. Thus, by comparing the two groups and seeing if the difference is significant, you can get an idea as to whether your intervention had any effect. While researchers should know better, they will often still jump to conclusions and claim that a causal link was found when really they've only shown a correlation. Is the study you're reading guilty of that? The placebo effect. One of the biggest confounding variables that researchers have to contend with in research is the placebo effect. The placebo effect is what happens when a participant feels differently because they believe they will do. Give someone a new drug to treat their flu and they'll be optimistic that they're going to get better. That alone can then improve their immune system and the result will be a faster recovery. The solution then is to use a blind study, meaning the control group will receive a sugar pill and the experimental group will get the real treatment, only they don't know which one they're getting. Thus, the placebo should affect both groups equally, so any difference can be considered the result of the active ingredients or the lifestyle changes or whatever it is you're testing. So in a double-blind experiment, the researchers don't know which of the groups is the experimental group and which is the control group, and neither, of course, do the subjects. This is so that the 
researchers can't accidentally introduce any kind of bias through their knowledge of the experiment. For instance, it might be that the experimenter goes to the experimental group and says, so have you noticed any benefits yet? And then they go to the control group and they go, so notice any benefits yet? Probably not. And that subtle difference could influence the way that the participants view the experiment and therefore we might see the placebo effect being stronger in the experimental group than in the control group. So if neither party, if nobody knows who's the experimental group and who's the control group, then there's no chance of that happening. Longitudinal studies. You also need to consider the length of the study. How long was this new diet and exercise regime trialed before it was concluded that it worked or didn't work? Sometimes a new diet can cause positive effects in the short term, like weight loss, but very negative effects in the long term, like death. If you were to study the starve yourself diet for two days, you'd probably say it was very effective. Longitudinal studies then are very useful as they monitor their participants over very long periods of time, sometimes their entire lifetimes. Of course, these studies are also largely impractical, however, so they are fewer and further in between. Another problem with the longitudinal studies is that they can't take place in the lab, meaning you can't control for many variables, resulting in correlations rather than causation. Animal studies. Many health studies are conducted on animals due to those pesky ethical issues surrounding the use of human test subjects. Unfortunately, we're not allowed to test genetic engineering or obscure new drugs on humans, so we have to use animals instead, normally rats or mice. While this will usually be fine due to the similarities in our biology, it's not the most representative sample in the world. One of the biggest differences, of course, being size. Although it's not quite that clear cut because it does appear that the smaller the animal, the larger the relative dose is required to trigger an effect. Foul play. Finally, it's worth noting that it's very easy to manipulate data and design studies to pull the wool over someone's eyes. So it's always important to look at who funded any study because there might be ulterior motives which could intentionally or unintentionally have skewed the results. So for instance, you might have heard of type A and type B personality theory. The type A personality is the go-getter, is the competitive type, the driven type. Type B is much more placid, relaxed. Turns out that this uh, personality theory is based on nothing. It's based on research done by, funded by the cigarette industry in order to try and prove that cigarettes weren't unhealthy. The idea being they wanted to show that type A personalities were more likely to have heart attacks and strokes and uh, hypertension. And they also wanted to show that type A personalities were more likely to smoke. And that way they could say that the link between smoking and heart attacks wasn't anything to do with the actual cigarettes causing the heart attacks, but rather there was the confounding variable, that being the fact that those people were more driven. That's not to say that type A personality and type B personality don't exist or that we don't have competitive and non-competitive people, it's very likely that we do. However, that study was done for the wrong reasons and we now quote this theory as though it was just as valid as any other personality theory when actually there was a very set objective for looking into it. Sometimes, of course, there can be some real foul play going on here where they might use the median instead of the mode because it paints a better picture or they might even completely remove outliers from their study, say this person was too extreme in order to completely change the average or to make the study significant when it wouldn't have been otherwise. Again, you've just got to use your own critical thinking, do some reading, and ideally look for more than one piece of research that backs up the same point. That is something I'd like to emphasize, is just because something is funded by a certain group, that doesn't mean that the study wasn't carried out correctly. Actually, almost all research is funded by somebody, and of course, that's normally gonna be a party that has an interest in the outcome. Shut it off! Shut it off! As long as the study was carried out correctly, then it shouldn't matter who funded it. And that's why you need to use a critical eye. Do you trust the researchers and looking at the methods they used? Is there any way this could have been skewed? And for those thinking that natural supplements are better because they aren't funded by Big Pharma, just remember that those homeopathic remedies that have been shown countless times not to work are still making a ton of money themselves. If pharmaceutical companies just wanted to make money, don't you think they'd be selling those as well? Yes, research can sometimes be confusing, cynical and difficult to understand. But don't use this as an excuse to stop researching and put your faith in some magic plant that no one is willing to test. While there are many more factors to consider when assessing a health study, this post will hopefully have given you enough information to start getting a better idea of what works and what doesn't. The question is, what do you do with all that information?
So I hope you found this video useful and interesting, guys. If you did, then please leave a like, please share it around. That helps me out immensely. Let me know in the comments down below if I missed anything. I'd love to know your thoughts. I've got a whole lot more like this on the way. If that sounds good, then thanks a ton for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.